Hello, this is Helen Dexter, uh, course convener of PL7505 International Security. And these slides are just a brief introduction to the Copenhagen School and securitization. So hopefully one of the things that you picked up from your first week's reading and discussion is that um, security studies is a very disparate discipline. There are lots of different ways of thinking about security. So we can think about traditional security studies as being a realist approach to security. This approach to security is still dominant in the United States. And then there's critical security studies. And even within critical security studies, there are different schools of thought, different ways of thinking about security. And these slides are just a brief introduction to what's become known as the Copenhagen School. Um, an analytic approach to thinking about security. Um, but I just want to kind of warn you about thinking about schools of thought of being, as being too fixed. Even within what's known as a school of thought, you're going to have individual scholars whose ideas might differ slightly from other people within that school. And you might also find that the ideas that are attributed to one school of thought overlap with another school of thought. So... When we take a critical approach in our own research, it's always about questioning categories. And that goes even for schools of thought in the way in which groups of scholars are presented to you as a school of thought. So always look beneath the category, look at the individual scholars and individual works themselves. And, you know, if you think you can find links or overlaps, then that's absolutely fine. So the Copenhagen School... Um, is so called because it is a school of thought that emerged at the Conflict and Peace Research Institute in Copenhagen, and it's represented in the writings of Barry Bazan, Ollie Weaver, and others who responded to the post Cold War call to reconceptualize security at the end of the Cold War. So, um, the first thing we need to think about is, is what does this school of thought mean by security? Well, so as to keep the term security is a coherent concept, Buzan and others tie it to the notion of survival. So within this school of thought, security is about surviving. And a security concern, according to the Copenhagen School, must be articulated as an existential threat. So the first thing we can say about the Copenhagen School is that in answering this question, what is security, one of the key questions that we uh, looked at last week, they don't deviate very far from a traditional understanding of security. But what the Copenhagen School does do is it suggests that there might be other reference objects for security other than the state. So we can argue then that perhaps the Copenhagen School broadens the notion of security but it doesn't necessarily deepen it. So in his book, uh, People, States and Fear, Barry Bazan sets about broadening the subject of security to include not just the military sector, but five categories. Um, and he sets out military, economic, environmental, societal and political security. So in terms of the military sector of security then, um, this is the familiar realm of traditional security studies. The political category of security, as set out by uh, Buzan, um, puts the state, the regime or an ideology, as example, as the referent object of security. So we could ask questions such as what threatens the ruling political party or how can a party be secured? Um, economic security might be related to competition for scarce resources, fiscal stability, you only need to turn on the TV or read a newspaper in Europe today to see how uh, important the idea of economic security is at the minute. It can also refer, uh, refer to a fear of poverty or starvation. So this would all, these would all be topics that come under the idea of economic security. Societal security may involve things such as a threat of a shared language dying out, a challenge to cultural traditions or systems of values. Societal security is perhaps what George W. Bush was referring to in the, uh, during the early days of the war on terror when he would refer to our way of life. Um, and this is something that we're going to think about a little bit more in just, uh, just a little while. Environmental security 
may involve natural disasters, health issues such as the spread of disease or ecological issues such as climate change. And the idea of thinking about climate change as, as a security threat um, is now quite popular. For uh, Buzan, then, the security agenda revolves around all of these five categories, not just the military sector as traditional security studies held. So you can see that he has broadened security studies and he's, and he's added more reference objects. Um, so, I mean, a good place to start your analysis is always by asking the question, what's missing? So you could say, well, what's missing from these categories of security. Gender, for instance, isn't listed as a category or a reference object. So perhaps we could think about uh, whether gender needs to be a separate category of security or whether a gendered analysis can be incorporated into the other five categories. You'll notice also that the individual is missing from this list of categories. So um, Buzan dismissed the idea of uh, human security or individual security as meaningless, arguing that it was either synonymous with human rights or it manifested itself at a higher level. So the in individual security is protected, say, by the state or comes under military or economic. Um, and we're going to look in more detail at human security next week, so it's something to think about. So the idea of societal security has become a flagship of the Copenhagen School. It provided a new level of analysis, acknowledging for the first time the distinction between the, society, the security rather, of the state as a territory and the population and the ruling regime. So the ruling regime may have security concerns of their own, which may put the security of the people, of the population within that state at risk. Um, so it separates the idea of the state from the population and the people. Um, and the concept also highlights that the coherence of a society can be threatened by other things other than simply violence or force. So again, that's broadening the idea of what can be considered a security threat. One of the things that might be good for you to discuss in the forums are problems or critiques you can think of of the idea of societal security. So um, one of the things we might say about societal security is that it assumes a coherent society. It assumes that there is a coherent society that we can secure. Um, so we need to ask questions like, well, do all members of society really share the same values or culture, or is society more fragmented than a coherent single body? Um, does the idea of societal security and trying to secure a society reify society and, in fact, reinforce structures of dominance within it? Um, who decides what the values of our society are? Do we give enough space and voice to marginal or dissident insecurities? What about minority rights? So is society a fixed thing or is it fluid and ever changing? Um, <clears throat> to secure something then we can say that we have to fix it before we can secure it. We ha there has to be something to secure. And so security is also about naming. So perhaps what the Copenhagen School is best known for is the idea of securitization. And securitization is the idea of um, security not as an objective state of affairs, but rather as a particular kind of discourse. It's a discursive construction of a particular issue as a threat. So MacDonald uh, quite neatly summarises what securitization is. He says securitization can be defined as the positioning through speech acts usually by a political leader, of a political issue as a threat to survival, which in turn, with the consent of the relevant constituency, enables emergency measures and the suspension of normal politics in dealing with that issue. So, in this model then, something becomes a security concern when it's articulated as such. And the security, securitization model involves a spectrum. On the one hand, there are those issues that are not considered political issues. They're not included in the public debate, but are instead a private matter. Um, then along the spectrum, we have politicised issues, which are a matter of public policy and are part of the standard political system. And then at the other end of the spectrum 
are those acts that have been securitised. And here an issue is not just considered a matter of public policy, but is given special priority status. So securitising an issue results in the radicalisation of the range of possible policies that the securitising actor can enact in the name of this political problem. So as soon as something becomes associated with as a security concern, the choice of options open becomes radicalised. We can do more if we call something a security problem. Because the security discourse carries with it a sense of urgency, priority, alarm and crisis, actors can take extraordinary means in its name. So securitisation is then a two-stage process. First, a securitising actor carries out a securitising speech act by declaring a referent object to be under an existential threat. In order for this act to be successful, however, the securitising actor must convince a relevant audience that the threat is real. So a question we can ask ourselves then is, under what conditions would a securitisation be more likely to be successful? So would state actors, for instance, or non-state actors be more likely to successfully securitise an issue? Under what conditions would an audience be convinced of a threat? Another question to think about is motivations for securitisation. So why securitise an issue? Why take something out of the realms of normal politics and t take it into the realms of security politics? So um, would this be to gain popular su uh, support in order to secure the allocation of more resources towards a certain issue, to ensure more efficient handling of a particular issue, to move an issue quickly up the policy agenda, or to uh, enable perhaps uh, radical policies that wouldn't be accepted were it not for the threat, the looming threat. One of the questions that I've asked you to think about in the forums this week is um, whether the broadening of the security agenda is always a good thing. So are there certain issues that you think should be securitised, they should be taken from the realm of normal politics, in the terms of the, the Copenhagen School discusses this, and considered a security threat? And what are the pros and cons of securitising certain issues, such as migration, AIDS or drug use? As we go through the course, we're going to look at security issues that have been brought into security studies. So we're going to look at migration, the environment... So as we go through the course, we're going to look at various issues such as migration, AIDS and HIV, uh, transnational crime, and we're going to think about the political, the ethical and the theoretical implications of considering these issues as security threats. And another question you might want to think about on the forums this week is, can you think of cases where securitisation has failed? So what problems are associated with this theoretical approach to security studies? What kind of critique can we make? Well, we could argue that this approach to security suggests that security practices are always exceptional. Whereas, in fact, security practices could be thought of as structurally and institutionally embedded within society. So... Secondly, we could argue that although Buzan and others widen the security debate, they broaden it, they don't necessarily deepen our understanding of security. Security for the Copenhagen School is still about survival in the face of present threats. And finally, conceiving of security as a speech act means for Weaver and Buzan, if it isn't spoken, then it doesn't exist. What about then, say, structural violence? What about all the conditions that limit life chances of humans that are not articulated as security threats, such as global capitalism and the unequal distribution of resources? Now, on your reading list, the article by Matt MacDonald, I think, is a really good starting point as a critique of securitisation um, and a development of the idea of securitisation beyond simply the Speech Act. And I would recommend that everybody reads at least that. Um, the idea of securitisation then is going to feed through the rest of the course when we look at the broadening of security studies um, into areas that were considered previously as, as non-security threats. So it's kind of uh, the non-traditional security threats. Um, so this is something that I think that you should think carefully about and hopefully you can discuss some of the questions that I've raised in these slides on the forums.